Hello and welcome to the Internet Worship Service of First Methodist Houston. My name is Andy Nixon. I'm one of the pastors of First Methodist. Thanks for being here. The Psalms, if I had to characterize them in one word, would be this, honest. The Psalms are honest about the faithfulness of people, the unfaithfulness of people, and everything in between. And in Psalm 42, what we have is a psalm of grief. Things are not going well. Verse 6, my soul is downcast within me, therefore I will remember you. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls, all your waves and breakers have swept over me. This is a person who we might say in modern uh, parlance has been just devastated, just blown away uh, by difficult circumstances. And dare I suggest this is something that we know something about given the times that we are living through, but more on that in a minute. But this psalm is honest. And one of the things I love about the Hebrew scriptures, and I think Jesus poured into them mightily for this very reason, is, is that when there is deep despair, the scriptures express deep despair. When there is joy, the scriptures express great joy, mountaintop kind of experiences that are powerful moments with the Lord. But this is one of those uh, tough moments. This is one of those, uh, life is extraordinarily hard. There is suffering in my midst. And I don't have anything that I can do except ask the Lord to be with me in my time of pain. And at First Methodist Houston, what we're doing as we start uh, this month, uh, November, and this series together, is we're talking about grief. All of us uh, know what it's like to go through pain. And one of the things that I think distinguishes the mature Christian, or maybe the experienced Christian, is the fact that we go through pain, and we go through trials, and we go through suffering, and we go through faithfully. Because when times are tough, uh, that's when we have to cling to the Lord. And uh, when we do that, and we do that well, uh, the Lord will see us through. And when we step into a promised land, we are so joyful because we have been uh, through the suffering together. Uh, but this psalm expresses that uh, over and over and over. Uh, I say to the God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning oppressed by my enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? These are the words of somebody who is alone. Uh, these are the words of somebody who is desperate. Uh, these are the words of somebody that just feels abandoned uh, by God, by neighbor, uh, and everyone in between. It is so uh, devastating that even uh, a few verses earlier, outside of what we read today, uh, it said, my only nourishment comes from the tears that flow from my eyes into my mouth. Uh, I literally swallow my tears. I'm so sad uh, at what has happened to me. And scripture has moments like this, be it Psalm 42 or something like the book of Job, where Job asked the question to his friends, why is it that I am suffering when I have done nothing wrong uh, to the Lord? I've offended the Lord in no way. Why is it that I must be the one that suffers? Even Jesus asked a similar, similar question in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he looks at Jerusalem and he realizes, um, perhaps for the first time, who knows, uh, what's about to happen to him. And he says, my God, my God, uh, don't let this happen to me. If this cup can pass from me, the cup is always suffering in Hebrew scripture. If this cup can pass from me, please let it go from someone else to someone else. But then Jesus says, in, in the way every prayer perhaps should end, uh, but not my will, but yours. So the scripture, if you will, is honest in that when somebody is having a bad time or a bad day, uh, they say it. And so uh, let's just pause there for a second. Because one of the reasons we wanted to talk about grief and about suffering, uh, <laughs> knowing that this would not be the most popular series we've ever done, but it may be the most necessary because all of us are going through this in some way or another right now. And the best way, or one of the best ways, I think, to begin to deal with grief is to think about it honestly. So let's do a little thing. I'm going to count to three, and uh, I'll say one, two, three. And then when I cue you, I want you to say the first word that pops into your mind about the last eight months, okay? So the last eight months, first word that pops into your mind, one, two, three. Say it. What was the word? Now, 
I want to do it one more time because my guess is some of us gave an honest answer, but some of us might have tried to sugarcoat it just a little bit or maybe make it sound not quite as bad as it is. Like I might have said on, on the first go, the last three months have been trying. They've been an ordeal. But if you were to probe into the pain of that a little bit more and just be a little more honest, perhaps, what's the second word that comes into mind on three? One, two, three. Painful, brutal, trying. That was my first one, but I think there's a layer under that. You know, say this has been awful. It's just been terrible if we're just flat honest about it. Uh, We haven't been able to do the things we used to do, and even if we have not been touched directly by this disease, uh, it has just been a time where everything has been disrupted. I've said it before because Ashley Sanford, one of our counselors, said it to me when this was first starting out, and she said, everybody's right now, it's kind of like at a low simmer. Uh, We're all just kind of, you know, just, just about to boil over any second, in any moment something can happen, and kaboom, my guess is all of us have had moments like that. You know, I've, I've been sitting at home or working at church and home or trying to do online devotionals or Facebook, what it is, and then something happens, phone rings, I, I get some piece of news that's minuscule, kind of bad in some way, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, I just want to bang my head against the table and say, when does this stop? This COVID-19 thing is awful. And, and so part of what I think is a way to handle grief or some of the emotions we feel is just to be honest with it and express it. And, like the psalm, express it to the Lord. Now, uh, you may say, I don't want to whine in front of Jesus. You you may say, I don't want to uh, just kind of have a temper tantrum. But let me tell you, Psalm 42 is kind of one of those things where it gives us permission to speak what is on our mind. And if I am suffering, if I am in pain, if I'm having a difficult day, express that honestly to the Lord. Because here's the thing, Jesus has heard it before. You are not going to say anything to Jesus that he hasn't heard. You are not going to say anything to Jesus he does not know. Uh, He can handle this. But part of us going through grief and going through grief well, or a time at loss well, I think is, is trying not to paper over the emotions, but rather to dwell in them, okay, and to express them. Sometimes I put it this way. It's like when we're dealing with grief, grief or loss or trauma, whatever it is, it's like having a rock in our shoe and to say, you can walk um, so many steps, you can make it so far uh, and not address it and just kind of live with it as inconvenient as it is. But there's going to be a time where you've got to just sit down, take your shoe off and get the rock out of your shoe. And what I mean by that is, is grief is a similar way in the sense that there just comes a time where we have to dwell in the emotion, to dwell in the loss, to live into the suffering. And here's the thing. God, I think, doesn't necessarily move to make the suffering go away, at least not initially. But the promise that Jesus makes us is he will be with us in our suffering, and you will find him there. So the second thing, after saying just, you know, how how do we deal with grief? One, be honest. The second thing I would say is live with it with the Lord. In other words, bring Jesus in to your suffering. And that's what, that's what kind of, uh, I, I think, is, is, is done when we express it. We invite Jesus to come and, and to be with us, and we find out that he is there. If you look at the Gospels, uh, I just finished a study of the Gospel of Luke with some people here at First Methodist Houston, and one of the things we marveled at over and over and over is, is that Jesus, you know, reaches out to the outsider, uh, the tax collector, uh, the soldier, the prostitute, the unclean person, uh, the Samaritan, the person who's dirty or ostracized in some way. That's true in that the Gospel of Luke makes that point over and over. But another truth is, is that he always reaches out to people who were suffering in some way. I, I mean, the person who is the leper is sick, right? Uh, The woman who has a scandalous reputation is being scorned every moment of every day until Jesus reaches out to her. The Samaritan knows what it's like to be racially oppressed because of the parents that he had. A Samaritan is is somebody with one parent who's Israeli and one parent who's not, and, and they were pushed to the side because of their race. So Jesus didn't just reach out to the outsider, he also reached out to the person who was suffering, And part of the reason he did that, I believe, 
is because it's God's promise to be with us when we're in pain. And Psalm 42 uh, does that to us. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. You see, Psalm 42 is a little bit like a, like a boat in the sense that, you know, when you're, when you're driving a boat, and, and I am not a nautical person, you will discover that very quickly as I tell this story, but, you know, when you're in a boat, you're headed a general direction, but winds and waves come, and, and they may just put you off course a degree or two, and you will have to correct for that. And what I think Psalm 42 is saying to us is that some life is like that, in the sense that something will happen to us that causes us grief, There'll be a tragedy, there'll be a loss, there'll be a COVID-19, there'll be something that, that, that takes us off course, but it's our faith that draws us back. And so what God is doing and what God encourages us to do is to make sure we steer back to the direction that we need to go. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me. This is a prayer of the God of my life. That is his faith calling the psalmist home. And it's a voice that you and I should listen to. And when we do that, I think, the way I like to say it, is we dwell with our pain or dwell in our pain with the Lord. And when that happens, something profound can occur. Now, as I was thinking about today and talking or, or visiting with you all about grief, uh, one of the phrases uh, that came to my mind, and on Monday I read the scripture passage for the coming Sunday. I always pray, uh, Lord, give me an experience uh, of this scripture this week. And the phrase that came to my mind was, um, I'm going to date myself here, but when I was a kid, uh, one of the things that I always look forward to watching this holiday time of year was the Charlie Brown uh, Peanuts special on TV. And I remember it very well. There were three uh, channels uh, back in my day, and uh, they had this bright colored bar that said special, and then it would spin, and then they would launch into the animated thing that was usually just, just for kids. But I remember watching Charlie Brown uh, as a kid. I remember reading the comic strip that Charles Schultz would write. And of course, the main character, uh, Charlie Brown, highly autobiographical. But one of his phrases that he said over and over uh, after something didn't go his way, which for Charlie Brown, that was quite often, was the phrase, good grief. He would say that over and over when something didn't work out, uh, when he didn't kick the football that Lucy was holding, uh, when he ended up flat on his back, you would hear him say something like, ugh, and good grief. And I was, I, was, I was thinking about that phrase, good grief, and, and it's an expression for Charlie Brown, but um, if, you de if you dig into Charles Schultz, which I encourage you to do a little bit, and you read some of the Peanuts comic strips, you'll see that there is a lot of profound wrestling with some deep concepts. And so this phrase, good grief, I think can be helpful to us in the sense that when we go through grief, and we go through it well. When we go through this COVID-19 pandemic, and we go through it well, the hope is, the prayer is, the goal is, is that maybe during, but if not during, at least after, we'll look back and we'll say that it was good. Good, why? Because it wasn't painful? No, it was. But grief can be good when we go through it well, because what grief does is it causes us to see things for the importance with which they are. And we cling to the things that matter to us most. So it's no doubt, it's no, it's no surprise that the psalmist clings to his faith because life is extraordinarily difficult. Grief has a way of doing that to cause us to see what matters most. There's a uh, Charlie Brown comic strip, Peanuts comic strip. I was th uh, thumbing through some earlier this week to kind of explore this phrase, uh, good grief, right? And um, I came upon, it's on my Facebook page if you scroll down and want to see it, but it's, it's Snoopy. And Snoopy is uh, lying on top of his doghouse and, and he is pondering a meaningless existence to life. Uh, he's, where's the meaning of life? There is no meaning. Uh, he even has a phrase on his doghouse as he looks and stares up at the sky. Even the skies have no meaning to me, uh, Snoopy says. And that actually sounds something pretty close to what the psalmist, I think, would write. 
So he lays there, he bemoans his condition, he can't find any meaning in life. And then in the last panel, Charlie Brown comes with his dog dish full of food, and all of a sudden Snoopy snaps to life and says, meaning. Now, it may be meaning because he's being fed. <laughs> there's a lot of meaning in good food, that's for sure. But I also think there's a deeper significance there that Charles Schultz was going for in the last panel, and to say meaning is found in the connections that we have with one another. And one of the hallmarks of the Charlie Brown comic strips and I think the shows uh, that I watched as a kid is that each character had powerful friendships with the others. And through that, they got through whatever it is that they had to endure. Ch uh, Charles Schultz, at his height, uh, Snoopy or Peanuts, uh, was distributed to, uh, I guess, about 30 or 75 countries, 21 languages, 330 million people uh, read the comic strip every single week in its heyday because I think it had something profound to say about who we can be for one another. So to get back to the psalmist for just a second, I think that underlying his, uh, as the psalmist writes, underlying his suffering and as, as he uh, laments uh, what it is that he is going through, underneath it all is a deep and profound faith. He has a relationship with a God that he loves and can trust. He has a relationship with a God that he can talk to. And this is exactly the kind of person that Jesus is. And so, I don't know, sometimes I find uh, that I talk to people who think of God as inaccessible. Uh, sometimes I talk to people who think of God uh, as somebody that I cannot bring my petitions or request. But the psalmist gives us a good model, and Jesus, even a better one, uh, in that our, our God is one that we can speak to. And so when, when you pray, Pray as if you're talking to your best friend. Tell God what is on your heart today. And if it's troubling news, share that. If it's joyous news, share that. Because God above all wants to hear, right, our petitions. And then God also asks us to do the same. The first commandment that God gives to Israel in the Old Testament is to hear, O Israel, I am the Lord your God. God listens. God asks us to listen in return. And when we do that in prayer, we can step through whatever situation we're in, grief or otherwise, and do so faithfully. Life will throw us a, a tremendous amount of challenge. There is a huge amount of pain in this world. I was thinking earlier today about a mission trip that I was on in India, probably one of the most spiritually difficult decisions or, or, or trips I've ever been on because the thing I saw there was suffering in just poverty at a huge scale and walking through the slums of Mumbai was one of the most difficult things I've ever done. I have never seen that humanity suffer in that scale to that degree and it was awful just to see that and to witness that every single day. But finally, just in my room one day, I just broke down and said, Lord, what am I supposed to learn through this? What am I supposed to do? How can I fix these huge, massive problems that I see? And the Lord spoke to me and said, you can't, but dwell with me, be with me, see these people's pain, and let's see if this can focus and channel and change your ministry so that suffering becomes less because of what you do in my name. When we dwell in our difficulty with the Lord, that's when I think our faith, our work, our lives are shaped and used in an extraordinarily powerful way. The other day I was talking uh, to somebody about uh, all this uh, COVID stuff that we've been going through, and, and I said, I said, uh, uh, or they asked me, they said, how are you doing? Which I really appreciated being asked. And I said, to tell you the truth, I'm not doing well. This has been really, really hard. And, and the, the person I was talking to said, well, just remember the Lord never gives you more than you can bear. And I said, you know, I know that's true. I believe it. Uh, but sometimes the Lord has more optimism about what I can do than I do. And that produces a problem. But we work through it you see, together. My friend asking me how I'm doing, praying to the Lord, surrounding myself with good friends, good people. These are the things that allow us to get through grief and to do it well. So my final suggestion would be, if you're somebody who's having a difficult day, difficult week, difficult few months, find some good friends, reach out, 
Tell folks what's going on. If it's, if it's a little severe, it's a time to reach out to a counselor. There's so many good people who are out there who can help us get through times like this. But grief is never somebody, something that we should move through, nor do I think we can alone. But if we do it together, we'll make it through. And ultimately, that's what the psalmist knows. When he makes his request to the Lord, saying, where are you in the midst of my suffering? The Lord shows up, and then God reaches out and lifts him up, and God will do the same thing through you and through me, through Christ. Mm -hmm.